properly before we begin. So if you're on a mobile device, uh, you'll find that by the three dots button at the bottom. Now, towards the end of the session, we're gonna open it up to questions. So please, you here at the back end, invite you to turn on your video and under direct. Okay. We now, oh, hello, Cinnamon. Good to see you, darling. Will not see you, but hear you. So moving on to the more formal part of the proceedings, I'm just keeping what's going on in the background here. Portal has been brought to life across the traditional lands of the Wadarung and Eastern Ma people of the Kulin Nations. We acknowledge them as the traditional owners and protectors of this place, the first creators on country and indeed of country. We acknowledge their ancestors who cared for the land, rivers and sea and all of its creatures for thousands of generations. We pay our respects to elders past, present and future who continue on this path. Portals, oh, we're live on Facebook, everyone. Portals July series of Sunday morning sessions focuses on the intimate space of the conversation. Each one is led by one of the many incredible women in the Shire's arts and cultural life. Some of them young and only just beginning their professional life in the arts, some First Nations, some multi-award winning, and one, Julie Dyer, who we invited to begin the series today, an absolute champion of the arts across the surf coast for more than 25 years, a role she maintains through her ongoing position on Surf Coast Arts Inc, an organisation she helped found with Mark Trinham more than two decades ago, and to whom she has dedicated so much of her passion and expertise. Julie and her family moved to the surf coast in 1995, Initially, Julie discovered and met people by volunteering in the arts community before commencing work as the Surf Coast Shire's Arts Development Officer in November 1995. Julie worked with local artists and the broader community on a plethora of projects across many sectors. These ranged from the Torquay and Alimatic Sundial to numerous mural and arts projects, including the Dean's Marsh Stage Curtain, Torquay High Tide Festival, and of course, what brings us here today, the Surf Coast Arts Trail. Her philosophy of enabling and developing artists incorporated supporting and advising groups and individuals in their endeavors. From this burgeoning local arts activity, Julie has proudly seen that within Australia, the Surf Coast Shire has been recognized as a cultural hotspot. No mean feat, Julie. Julie's guest in conversation today is an artist whose extraordinary diversity of output and passionate commitment to the world around him, as witnessed in everything he does, makes him one of the leading artists of our region. Never one to blow his own trumpet, although he probably plays that too, Mark is a full-time professional artist and has resided on the surf coast since 1990. He's been involved in many public art installations, exhibitions, events, and festivals throughout this time. Through his art, Mark aims to bring focus to the natural environment and community, celebrating the spirit of this land through a wide variety of mediums, including sculpture, public art, graphic design and illustration, music, and events. If you want to explore more of Mark's work after this session, you can find him at www.marktrinham.com.au and, of course, on Insta. And finally, just before I leave you, remember you will have the opportunity to ask questions at the end of your session, so please jot them down, keep them going. You can put them into the chat, uh, chat function, you know, and we will record them at the back and then I'll call you back in. But now, everyone, if you would please join me in welcoming Julie Dyer and Mark Trino. Thanks, Harriet. And Thank you. Hi, Mark. Hi, Julie. <laughs> and, um, this thanks, is interesting. It is interesting. <laughs> thanks, everyone, for joining us um, in Mark's beautiful art-rich home. And thanks, Fee, who's out there busily listening and being quiet. <laughs> um, our format will be a bit of conversation and um, Harriet and her team will be popping images up along the way and they'll either illustrate what we're talking about or be chat prompts and um, we'll see how things go. So, Mark, it's sure. been a long journey to get <laughs> to this point. It has. Um, and as Harriet mentioned, you arrived um, in 1990 here, but I'm going to get you to talk about what 
led you to get here? What were the, the what was your journey prior to getting here, and what were some of your aha moments even along the way? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it's well interesting. You're you're going to see some photos throughout this sh um, interview, and it's interesting just going back through a history of. Um, I guess my journey as an artist, and I'm hoping that there are a few emerging artists and younger artists out there that can glean a bit of information from this and um, yeah, get an idea from my journey of how I got to where I am now. So I guess um, pivotal moments, I think one of the, uh, what a major moment for me was when I started my year 11. I grew up in the country on a farm. Uh, I went to a tech school near Frankston and we un the school only went to year 11. Uh, most people got <laughs> apprenticeships and um, things at that point. So here's a photo of me when I was 15, 36 years ago. This was the first mural that I created. So when I started year 11, I was, I was steered into a, an applied science stream because I guess a lot of people thought that there was better job opportunities. And of course, no one was very enc too encouraging about following an arts career. So because I was in, in a um, applied science stream, I only had one elective in year 11. So my heart was really set on though, on an elective as what I was passionate about. So. I was really keen on woodwork and art. So I had two preferences that I could choose and I chose woodwork and art and I thought this is gonna be like a flip of a coin. Um, and I remember that first day and I turned up and I got automotive engineering. <laughs> and um, <Joy. laughs> nothing against automotive engineering, but it really just did not float my boat. So here I was a shy uh, 15 year old kid that you know I went to that class and I said no and I ended up um, being put into engineering workshop practice and I said no and then I went into home economics and it was yeah I was I put myself outside my comfort zone and I actually fought and I got other kids together and this a lot of this um, talk today is going to be about joining forces with with like-minded people so we wrote some letters and we end up getting a timetable change and a few weeks later, I ended up with art. So I put my heart and soul into art. I then, um, I then did my year 12 at, a, at Frankston TAFE and I did art and design. And that was probably the most amazing year um, where I, all of a sudden I discovered that there are other people, other students like me and that we shared a similar um, interest and passion for um, art and also the environment and telling a story. So from that, that led me to then um, three year graphic design diploma at university. And I must say that wasn't an easy road getting from one to the other. You really have to apply yourself. You really have to, really have to fight hard all the way to through interview processes to get to each of those institutions. Um, and then, yeah, out of, out of university, I managed, I, I got myself a job in a graphic design studio in Fitzroy, moved to Melbourne. And um, I worked there for about 12 months. And at that time, computers were coming in. We didn't study with computers. Computers just came in and all of our clients had um, in-house designers that, with computers. So the old fashioned style of, um, graphic design studios started to die off. So Not less manual. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah. So I've been used to working in groups. So, and I really fed off those groups. Mm -hmm. um, so here I was, I found myself solo. Um, I, I started doing freelance illustration, graphic design work, Penguin Books and various people. I was living in St Kilda. I met up with a guy who was a surfer and we dreamt this idea of creating Blue Earth clothing. So at the age of 21, I, we set up this business, which we turned into a company. Um, we there, yeah, we, we um, operated through the surf industry. That was our, our vehicle. 
Um, at the same time, I got involved with an environmental action group called the Rainforest Action Group and Friends of the Earth, and I became an environmental activist. And it was very, very quickly, I realised that my strength as an activist was through my art. So I was doing various artworks for um, these groups. Um, yeah, and that obviously um, strengthened my uh, work with, with Blue Earth, which I ran for about five years. And um, with a guy called JR, who reloc we, we relocated down to the surf coast with the business in 1990. Yeah, so um, yeah, you, you weren't like Mr Bean and you just appeared, you actually <laughs> did, did get here by, by this way. Yeah, and the other thing yeah. I, 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 must, uh, I must add too, the, the important thing that I, why we, we moved to not re wasn't just the business yeah. or anything, yeah. but it was because through those art schools, I've met really great people and have made close contacts with the art community in in Torquay, the Gittings family, um, especially. And that was my connection to uh, finding my, my creative tribe. A beautiful image popped up. Yeah. So, and um, so I came here in 1995. And, but from what you're saying, in that lead up from me arriving and when the Shire actually started acknowledging and being more involved in the arts. Um, Tony McCormack, who was the um, administrator when the amalgamations happened, um, got a, a, their position for an arts officer up and going and Noelle Curry came on board and she was the first arts officer in the Shire. And she was there for about six months and then she moved on and the position appeared and what I'd been doing voluntary for ever in a day um, and all of the work that I've been doing as a volunteer all of a sudden was able to be utilised and I came on board. And I can tell you now, and it's possibly still the same, people at the Shire didn't know what to do with an arts officer, so, but it, it was fine and we were able to advise um, and get involved with um, things like the Analytic Sundial. So the Lions Club had no idea how to work with the artists at the time. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, but to get to that stage, there was a lot of things happening earlier. So um, be much before the Analytic Sundial happened. So tell tell us what was happening in your world. In yeah, your well, world, well, uh, arts offices were quite rare. We'll get back oh, to that. But um, yeah. yeah, in that time of um, when I was, was doing my Blue Earth uh, work, and I was in amongst a creative community, um, that creative community that. Um, I found myself in, there were some great people and great artists. And as a collective, we propped each other up, we inspired each other. We set up a, a gallery called Talking Art and a committee. And that committee of, um, of artists was what led to um, approaching the Shire. The Surf Coast Shire had just formed. Um, and we approaching the Shire and arts officers weren't very common at that time, but yeah, it was it was something that we lobbied to get an arts officer in place. So this little um, gallery, a, a shop in, in, in Torquay, it was a, an artist collective gallery. Um, we had life drawing classes out the back and there was performances in the street. We, you know, basically we didn't have any facilities for the arts. There were some great galleries like Kudos down in Lawn, but as far as um, here in Torquay, there was there was not the facilities for the art. So, as artists, we created, and I get a lot of this this discussion and a, and a lot of my background is about um, motivating ourselves to create something. To because you know in the arts you don't, often don't get handed anything; you have to create it all yourself. So, if we can just go back a couple of photos. Um, yeah, some of those, so in, the, in that little period of time, um, I was working in developing my fine art, my painting and my, um, my liner prints and everything. Um, and it was through my, my, my newfound creative family that um, had the opportunity to work on the, on the sundial, which was designed by Claire Giddings and um, Glenn Romanus. And there was about seven or eight artists that worked on, on that. 
And Julie had an involvement um, with that facilitating because maybe I was just in my own little bubble, but um, I was emerging as an artist and I felt like the art, art on the surf coast was emerging as well into the public realm because um, there were there had been some great murals that um, Susan Barlow Clifton and Claire Giddings um, and I'm sure there's others sorry if I leave anyone out but there, around town there were shops that had murals in them and, and different places. Yeah, it was quite extraordinary when we first moved down um, going into just Gilbert Street um, within that short length there was um, there were three shops that had significant artwork in them. Um, tapas, which is now a sandwich bar, um, and there were two um, fruit and veggie shops. And to, to go in there, you were going, wow, there must be some amazing people in this community just, mm. just from that little glimpse and how exciting. But it wasn't quite that easy and it wasn't, um, I mean, you were, they were lucky to have actually had that opportunity to do the work in those shops. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah. it's you know it doesn't come easy. You know, artists try and encourage this to happen, and, and when there's not a lot going on creatively, it is hard for the rest of the community to embrace it. Yeah. So I guess that's what I'm saying by making a start with with some of these art projects. It did start to grow mm -hmm. and. You know, I was attracted to this area, not only because of the, the strength and beauty of the landscape, but because of the creative atmosphere. Yeah. And we've seen the surf coast um, explode with people coming to it. And I'm sure that that has something to do with the atmosphere that, that brings them here. Yeah, yeah. And um, so through that time, there was, um, with Talking Arts, there was also um, the Talking Community had... Um, and I didn't experience, and I'm very sad that I didn't experience the Torquay Springding. Now, that was a um, community um, business festival, and at one stage, the, I believe that the, um, the business people actually handed over to some artists and um, Chocolate Lilies and Grass Tree Festival emerged and blossomed literally for a short time. Did yeah, you, yeah. You worked on that, that was well? uh, yeah. I really was in the background of that. I, yeah. Um, I think I, I enjoyed the festival, but, but yeah, it was before I, I got involved with um, any event organising. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Seven, Vinton and Anthea Amore were spearheading that. Yeah. Um, and yeah. Um, with, 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 so with, with all of those sorts of people, I mean, there, and that sort of came and went, but we also had lots of other. Um, a lot of the opportunities like the um, sundial came really from a bit of left of centre. So that was a Lions Club, someone actually finding an animaletic sundial and then they worked with the artists to get that happening. And then yeah. the, another project that was early in my um, purvey was the Bells Beach mural. And so that was um, saying you were obviously involved with yeah, I got them too. Yeah, and, and through my involvement with environment groups in Melbourne, I yeah, I actually worked with Sane, so I designed their logo, as you can see there. Um, and then we, yeah, we, they saw the opportunity at Bells Beach. Bells Beach was being degraded. So, again, people did realise that art had a, had a voice. So, so this, this is, the, yeah, that's what it looks like that people will know. And the, the image is a rare image that is still of um, that earlier toilet block. I'm glad I actually found that because... <laughs> <laughs> The, the plain toilet block was just vile. It was a yeah. pretty um, interesting period to for you to work on that as well. And it was an amazing thing having that um, cultural history because it wasn't just the environment. It was with Glenn and you working on it. We actually had yeah, that's right. That first sort of um, first people's information coming out. Really. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And again, a, a, an artistic collaboration. It was through working with Glenn and the other artists on the. Um, on the sundial um, that, yeah, we, we were, I was working with Sane and we were, and Sane came up with the idea and, and through the Shire and it, that was great having an arts officer at the Shire to actually assist um, for this to get through and be approved. Um, so yeah, I worked, yeah, we worked on that um, 
back in about 1996. That was, yeah, yeah. it was early 96. So the sundial was, in, I can remember taking scones and hot tea down to the sundial in March 96, <laughs> and this was a little bit later on in the year. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, nine, no, 96 was a big year for, yeah. for me. It's just talking about how one thing leads to yeah. another. And I went on and did the mural at um, Bird Rock. Um, and I think I was I was started to be called the Dunny artist, mm -hmm. and um, I was thinking this could be a, a lifelong career. I could just work my way right around the coast of Australia painting every <laughs> every Dunny. But anyway, I haven't done a Dunny since. So, um, <laughs> but yeah, and, and look, we were just learning on the job. You know, I was still I'd come from a graphics and illustration background, so I was still pretty much even with the mosaics of the of the sundial and the murals. I was still working in the 3D. So you know, we, we didn't have, um, there wasn't public art courses. There wasn't too many opportunities to learn at the time. So um, I'm not sure, Harriet, if everyone's seeing these photos. Um, Can people see the photos that, that, that are flipping through? I don't know. Can, don't, Harry, don't can know. you give us a thumbs up if other people are seeing the images? Right, okay. thank you. Okay, thank we'll you. just slow down on those for a bit. Yeah. Um, yeah, but anyway, the arts officer was 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 very important to help all that happen. This might be a good opportunity to actually ask Julie how, like back then there was, like we said, it was very, arts officers were quite rare. How did you actually get into that role? Or, yeah, so... So when I, um, as I mentioned, I'd been um, just working as a volunteer um, all my life through uh, through our family, often doing ushering at um, local theatre things that um, the old Victorian Arts Council brought down. Um, and when I shifted to the country, because I'm not a very sporty person, I actually went and door knocked up in stall and asked to join the Arts Council up there, um, which... Um, they almost died because no one younger than 50 were really involved in those days and I was in my early 20s. Uh, um, so I'd worked on projects um, and continued on even other places um, involved and, and grew and, and was actually in, on the board of Regional Arts Victoria. So I'd actually built up some skills in um, different elements and then this opportunity came and I went for it so what all of the things I've been done, doing as a volunteer actually got paid for which is a very nice thing for a, a period of time mm -hmm. and at that stage it was very early in the days of um, local government having arts offices there were there was an arts department at Geelong but it was more policy and with the amalgamations that got disbanded um, Leanne Stein down at Queenscliff was an arts mm -hmm. officer fairly about the time that I came and a bit later, um, Kaz Payton, who people would know from more recently being in Geelong, she um, got a job down at um, Colac. So there were three of us who were all part-timers doing um, this amazing work in the community, but with assistance and working with um, the voluntary capacity of the regional arts movement as well, which was um, yeah, great. So for me, it was a bit learning on the job, but as I said, because I had um, worked on projects through Regional Arts Victoria or the old Victorian Arts Council in these days, I actually had that background of going, well, the Lions Club actually do need to create a contract to have it with the artists when we're doing the sundial and you actually do need to get paid a reasonable amount. Admittedly, I did have a contract with a couple of artists when we were doing the Bells Beach mural, and I kept saying to them, "I don't have any more money, and <laughs> so you can only you can just do one wall." But they actually continued around the whole thing, basically as a voluntary <laughs> position and good experience, perhaps. And, and that still happens. Yeah, that's right. I'm sure it does. You know, as artists, yeah. we, we we try and create everything to the best possible. Yeah. Within budget, but you usually the best possible, yeah. you know, because we're passionate about it, it does go quite a few steps yeah. further. So one of the um, first things before I actually became the arts officer, I mean, I attended the um, early meeting where 
um, Surfcoast Arts was um, looking at getting going. But I also attended some meetings when, um, because the Spring Ding and Chocolate League Leaves and Grass Trees had fall, festival had fallen over and the council officers at that time were um, sort of talking about having perhaps a Shire-wide festival, which was, I think, what you're doing now, Harriet. Um, <laughs> and, um, and, and we went, oh, so we managed to, us who were locals, get it more based to Torquay. And it was held at the start of, of um, December, which was before all of the tourists and the camping ground people started to arrive. So it was really about acknowledging this space and this area um, as a very special space. Um, and it was ours. Mm -hmm. So the I worked on um, fire sculptures and what have you and did this work voluntarily prior to actually being employed um, with council and then I created a, a monster, but that's another story <laughs> to go into later on. <laughs> and, and, yeah. and during this time, yeah. what, what came about too was the formation of Surf Coast Arts, yes. which yeah. was the uh, Independent Arts Council, yeah. a committee of predominantly artists, which oh. was I've been told was quite it's rare quite at the time because yeah. the arts community is made up of not just artists, but arts appreciators and supporters. So um, in a lot of other areas, arts councils are made up of all those different people. But I think leading on from Talking Art, which was a, which was a strong group of artists, that, that, that just led naturally led into the formation of Surf Coast Arts. Mm -hmm. And I guess one of the early things that Surf Coast Arts did as well as being involved with the High Tide Festival was the creation or the, the support of the Torquay Cowrie Market, yep. which Christina Covington, um, started, and this is some graphics that I produced for that, um, which is still going. So the elephant walk, which is the elephant and the cowrie shell. So the, that's how the, the cowrie elephant came about. Um, yeah, and I remember it, it, it's starting off as, as you know, and this you talk about the evolution of things too, it, it started off as this great market um, because we didn't have facilities for a lot of facilities for the art. So people, emerging artists that couldn't afford to um, get a shop front or they didn't have a gallery to put their work into, we, so we, we specifically directed this market into the arts and craft. And music. And music. And, music and too, you know, that's where, you know, my band, which was starting about the same time, Muna, we, we would play oh. for three or four hours and then other people would come along and say, hey, can we use your PA? That's how I got into doing the sound engineering and the running of the Cowrie Market stage, So, mm. which has been running for... 21 years. 21 years, I yeah. think. So, and, and then, you know, that, that was... It, it's a much-loved event and it became um, something that people looked forward to. Uh, and taking that a step further um, was the creation of... You know, we talked about... Um, people coming in and being such a tourist area in summer so it was decided like during the before before the beginnings of of the nightjar festival um we were doing surf coast arts was doing beach gigs on the on the foreshore and we'd have these little mini one night festivals and that led to the idea of the nightjar festival which was um created by three local independent artists so myself kyla vinton and lindell flintoft and we created that and started running that again as another opportunity mm. for artists to um, market their wares, to showcase music and to bring people together. So we've got a couple more images there of, of the Nightjar Festival. There we all are. One of, one of the old props from a high tide festival. And, you know, we didn't have... We didn't have the venues and the theatres or anything like that to showcase performing arts as well. So this there was there was an opportunity to do this, and um, yeah, this was taken on as a private venture as well for the community. Uh, we employed local artists in in the creation of and the setups of, of of this festival. So it became a great a great vibe at the time. Well, and, the, and the ice carving, which yeah. is something that, again, I just 
you know, it was part of a high tide festival that we did ice carving and and that it keeps leading on. So, you know, as an artist, you've got to be, for me as an artist, to make a financial living out of it, you have to take opportunities, diversify um, and create your own opportunities. So when we've been chatting prior to this, creation by inspiration was one of that sort of terms that, that popped up and it, and it is often that mm. um, um, being involved or having something out there which all of a sudden inspires and takes you off on another journey yeah. um, in another direction, which is extraordinary. And, yeah. and one of those major inspirations was, you know, through Surf Coast Arts and Julie as an arts officer, getting involved, the art, creative community here got involved with Regional Arts Victoria Um and we were fortunate enough to work on some of their large projects. Um, this image here is a piece that I did down at Anglesey, but it was a statewide um, project, 12 different regions in the state. Um, Glen Romanus did one in Geelong. Um, but we, we were travelling to Melbourne. We were, we were involved with an arts organisation. We were meeting other artists that we had great mentors like Donna Jackson who who was facilitating this this project um, again it was an application um, side of things so coming up with concepts and designs mm. and then once it sort of all got rolling we had artists from those other regions coming and working with us and then when our project was finished we went and worked in other regions mm. and worked with them and it was just networking um, and Regional Arts Victoria gave us great opportunities with touring shows and um, arts conferences. It was, it was just, it was a pretty vibrant time. We were pretty hooked on going to all these different events. And, and yeah, it was, it, was, it was definitely very vibrant that yeah. we, we had a lot of fun. We haven't got a picture, but um, when the Millennium um, came, we were actually, in, we were one of the um, areas from Regional Arts Victoria um, and worked on a Millennium Project and we had um, fire sculptures and um, performance um, down at Cozy Corner. I think Fee was one of the dancers in, in, in those days um, performing and um, we had messages about um, that we wanted to leave in, in the last millennium and take forward into the new millennium and a small sculpture was created um, by Murray Cully um, leaving that and that's actually still in the, um, the garden in the corner of the staff garden area there. So um, it, it, it's still, so there are moments of that that still exist. But again, it was using some of the skills and then building on it and being able to, to go forward which and be inspired mm. and see what else would happen along the way too, which was great. So, yeah, yeah. And, and going to conferences and, yeah. and meeting other people it introduced yeah. us to other um, creative concepts that we could then bring to the surf coast that, you know, community could get in, involved and, you know, that the follow-on from one, one of the, one of the follow-ons from that was, you know, starting up the Wear Outrageous mm -hmm. events where people would create their own costumes. Artists. That whole environmental consciousness, I think, with um, where outrageous was interesting because we never really <laughs> had any specific. Um, <laughs> we, never, we never, we didn't actually ever have a specific um, theme, but it was just extraordinary how so many of the um, um, pieces were created out of created out of. Um, recycled elements or reflected the environment. Um, this is um, some fairly good um, examples. Um, Iris Walsh Howling, who will be one of the later um, speak, uh, parts of the conversation was an artist involved in this. And we had people from all over the, the region coming along and being involved. Um, Mark's um, daughter Priya's there. Step so stepdaughter Priya's yeah. there. <coughs> It's very exciting. 
and and then and then the high tide festival also had that really strong element of celebration of the environment a lot of the themes of the festival were um about the um environment so barb hollander and carla giddings was involved in making this beautiful sea dragon and claire giddings yeah. um, was making this beautiful sea dragon and so many other props and things that were used in the um in, in the productions and vibrancy it, vibrancy yeah. in our community and um, yeah, and Dave Kelman and, and a lot of other artists. There was a whole band that was sort of local musicians that was set up to, you know, what these festivals did was brought together. And they brought together artists of all calibers and, and also brought together youth theatre. And yeah. it, it was, yeah, a pretty vibrant time. And one of the great things about the festival, and this sort of, this is um, story making um, banners. Um, that it actually brought in community who wouldn't be involved in the arts as well. So as well as audience for the big productions, because you had kids in the thing, we had 3,000 people on the beach looking and watching art that was made locally and music that was created locally and written locally. We also had storytelling in simple ways um, led by some local artists. Veronica Phillips was in that last photo and another artist, Jan Preston, and they went out into the age community and got stories. So we actually had histories written down and then they were put out in places like the um, IGA supermarket or in, in um, cafes and what have you hung up so that it really involved the community in, in some yeah. amazing ways. So yeah, it's a good old IGA. Ah, <laughs> oh, Dean's Marsh Curtain. That was one of a project. So you were asking how I got involved. I got involved because I'm a community person and a lot of projects for me have begun because I've got really good nagging community people. So people nag me to death. Um, when I get together with um, some people who were involved in the early um Arts Trail, you'll find out about Naggers. Um, but this curtain came about because a, a, a local identity in Dean's Marsh, Margaret Stewart, wrote me letters and I would see her at historical society meetings and what have you. And there had been a curtain in Dean's Marsh that was made by the CWA ladies over about nine years um, from the end of the Depression leading into World War II. And that had been handed over, the original curtain had had been handed over to the Melbourne Museum. And Margaret felt it was time for a new curtain to be made. So I managed to discover um, Jan Preston, who's a community textile artist, and decided that she was the right person for the job. And we worked with the Dean's Marsh community there are over 27 textile techniques, all ages, all ex people with varying experience worked on it. And it is the story of Dean's Marsh in, in picture. It's um, quite an extraordinary um, project. Um, and it has an homage to the original curtain with a bit of um, a hessian on it because it was the first one was made in, on sugar bags. So, yeah, so it is the storylines of what happens in our community is quite, mm. it is, it's amazing. And it's, yeah, much broader than, yeah, just this little pocket that yeah. we're living in too, so. And, and we've been talking mm. too about community. Yes, oh, and, yes. And, and there's <coughs> so, someone actually, um, I did a talk years ago and I was actually asked the question, I was introduced as a community artist. So I was asked the question, what is a community, you know, I will actually ask them what is what is a community artist, and it was a bit vague. But I see that there's two there's two ends to the scale for community art. There's one like this curtain, which is basically artists facilitating the community to create art, and then there's the other side of community art, which is actually professional artists that are creating art in the community for the community and telling a story. Mm -hmm. So the artist part of part of the job. That, that was good to go to that yep. next slide. Next one. Yeah, part of the job of an artist in, in like what, what I'm doing is, is doing the research, 
finding out about, for me, it's the spirit of the place. And, you know, in, in collaborations, it's fantastic because you get together with other artists and you'll explore areas, you'll explore history, you know, the geology, uh, the natural history of the area, you'll explore um, the community, you'll get feedback from the community. And it's our job to try and interpret that and putting it into um, that process. So the images you're seeing here are some projects that are, that um, we're stepping back a bit to 1997, where um, as an emerging sculptor, you know, in working on the first three-dimensional um, projects, um, working with, I think that first one we had was Linker Park. That was an opportunity, it was called the Three Rivers Project, and um, it was an opportunity to work um, with, uh, with the Barwon Water as, as, a, as a host. Um, so Glenn Romanus and myself and Flip Ernest and Victor Seabergs worked on this project and we were telling the story of the Indigenous food, um, um, food garden and midden um, at Yulinka on the Barwon River. So we got to meet many people in the community that were experts in, in the history and also working with Wathurong Co-op and what we were exploring the area and getting, we got very excited. We, we, we planned about 20 years of sculptures to go along <laughs> the Barwon River. Um, <laughs> we, finished the, we finished the first one, which, which, is, which is what we were getting paid for. And, but, you know, at the time, we, our vision was big. We were seeing that this sort of work could go everywhere. So from that, we went straight to um, Barwon Heads and uh, the next image, which um, Glenn and I again uh, work, worked on that project and collaborated with um, Daryl Couple. And we were incredibly green. We did not, I don't mean green in the environmental sense, but um, green in, naive. in the naive sense. <laughs> we, just, we just designed things and we said, yeah, we can do that. And we, we did... We did things that we hadn't done before as artists, you know, building stone walls and, um, you know, carving timber and all these, yeah, quite large, quite large works that we started to create. But we had confidence that we could do it mm. and we found the people that could help us. And we tried to um, subtly sort of infiltrate the community to get their support. And, you know, yeah, it was, it was hard to get support. Um, yeah, people have different attitudes about art and public art and whether they're worth it. Um, and we still get that happening all the time. Yeah. So for me, um, the whole thing about um, creating special spaces and it's not just um, and, and, and turning it into a place. And so this is all about place making. Um, so all of the sculpture that I've encouraged throughout, I mean, there are over 50 works hidden throughout the Shire and some of them might be just in a playground. So mm. and you've worked on some great playground projects um, along the way. Yeah, there's a whole, yeah, yeah there's a variety mm. of projects. That last mm. image was working with schools and as, mm. as artists and especially public artists, we do a lot of work with schools and encourage um, students too. That, mm. yeah, and yes, it is a hard road, but there are careers in the arts mm. and it's it's about the storytelling they don't have to be a professional artist but they can see that there's ways of storytelling mm. that um, can come th you know through various forms of art whether it's music theater or visuals um, and we started to find that art was and again like I said I don't know whether it's my bubble because I was emerging as an artist and I just felt like the region was emerging in public art as well so we and working obviously having a supportive council. Um, we started to, you know, this this work here was was in Moriac and using recycled pier pylons, um, going back many years. And gosh, there's uh, there's hundreds of projects that that myself and artists that I collaborate with have worked on over the years. Um, and, you know, opportunities to turn, for example, this one, turn a, an eyesore of a stump. Um, go back one. It's, this one was an interesting job because, because this, this tree had been poisoned on the foreshore. Um, well, thought to be poisoned. It actually, um, we realised it had rotted at the base, but which killed the tree. But it was believed at the time it was poisoned so someone could get a view. So instead of cutting the tree down and giving someone their view, it was decided to create a, a sculpture out of it. And this was a sculpture of um, 
the old Inverlochy figurehead that used to be in that same spot, um, gosh, back in the 1940s, I think, yeah. or even okay. earlier. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's actually an old historical photograph that has a little cypress tree that's about this tall it's just next to it in the background, um, which is this tree. So telling that story and bringing history back again. Um, and the next piece is I'm just going to flick through and just explain the diversity of some of the, um, yeah, go back one, some of the diversity of types of work. So, you know, Glenn and I were commissioned to um, work on a piece for the Melbourne Museum telling the story. And as artists, we interpret stories. So the, the, the story of, um, of Wa the raven and pulling the fire stick out of the fire and being burnt and... Um, and, and the next shot is, is it in place in the Melbourne Museum. So there's such a diversity of where these, where these sculptures end up and, and the purpose for these sculptures. And I must take this opportunity to, to, to explain that, um, you know, as a, as a collaboration, Glenn and I worked together, you know, many years ago. Um, and then we went our separate way and, and did our own, developed our own works uh, for about 10 years and I think it's really important to work in collaborations but also to work individually because you have a you have an individual voice and a style that you want to come at but we do thrive off each of off each other and so Glenn and I got back together um, and set up a company in uh, about 10 years ago and I just want to take this opportunity to thank some of the the artists that have worked with us in production over the years especially Raphael Buttonshaw and Brodie Hill, who worked about yeah. eight years. Um, and yeah, working with chainsaws and various things to create some of these um, these projects. So basically you've been you're a mentor ultimately and a teacher by default doing this sort of thing. So That's from, right. from those early days, it's, it's actually come around full circle, yeah. which is exciting. There wasn't yeah. too many people doing this sort of work, but there was demand for it and we needed to um, have some assistance. So it's been, it's been a, a great opportunity to. Yeah. And Julie, you, and you mentioned playgrounds yes, and some yeah. of the fun- function- functionality of of art is we, we started to see it coming into playgrounds and started to develop um, a new style and a new, and new a new sense of um, so Shark Park and Anglesey you know that was you know these works were created by artists that was uh, again a work that um, was produced out of the Romanus Trium collaborations um, and there's a couple more there. Yeah, so, and again, it just, they started to get bigger and better. And um, some of the artworks in playgrounds weren't actually functional. They weren't things to climb on, but they were inspirational pieces. So we found that we, we worked on, on projects in, in places where people said they would just get vandalised. And it's very, very rarely happened. Mm. We keep getting it all over and over again. Why waste your money on this because mm. it's going to be vandalised? But a handmade piece of art um, is admired mm. and is not destroyed. And and again, as I said, it, it, it turns in making just a space into a special place and gives it an extra story in, in yeah. that community, which is um, gives it that sense of identity, which is really yeah. important. So yeah. all of these things are fantastic. And, and meeting yeah. places. Mm. Meeting yes, places yeah. have become... Um, almost expected now but for years they, they were they were always meeting places but you know not with the creative edge that they have now mm, yeah so the next lot i think um brings new identity into new spaces yeah and i yeah. guess mm. I, I guess i'm being a little indulgent with 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 these images and just to give people an idea of the type of and scale of works that that can that will be involved with. So working, working for development um, in the area, trying to, again, working with Glenn Romanus and our other artists, we tried to create a sense of or a spirit of place. Mm. Like you've got people moving into an area. Um, what is the story you want to tell them? What is the focus you want them to um, appreciate? 
And again, it goes back for us, it goes back to the natural environment, bringing the focus back to the land, which is what they all share and, and what's, what everyone has mm. in common and try and hopefully as an environmental crusader, you know, have people appreciate that natural environment. Mm. So you can keep clicking through some of the images. Yeah, let's 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 flick, keep on going. Flick through a few, yeah. and you know people will recognise some of these public art projects. Um, this one especially is it was was fantastic. Um, Glenn was working on a project. He invited me to be come on board, and it was interpreting um, elders' stories from the Diamantina uh, region in um, southwest Queensland on the edge of the Simpson Desert. And again, we went into an area where, where art um, or public art, they had, there was no public art. art artists were viewed um, in a, a very, I don't know, a sceptical light. You know, we, yeah. yeah. The names Arty Farty got used to quite a bit and things like that. And, you know, people that work with us, you know, we, the question was, you know, are you proud to be part of this? And they said, well, if people like it, we were part of it, but if people don't, then we keep our mouths shut. So yeah, yeah, working, having these opportunities as an artist, uh, one thing leads to another, and you get these sorts of opportunities. So the scale is extraordinary. When you yes, and you know this is a two two and a half hour drive from the nearest town, mm. um, so not a house to be seen between this and, and Birdsville. Mm. So if to come over a hill and see something like this, it makes people go wow and there's a story in this. Mm. Um, the other opportunities that we've been working on was obviously, you know, working with um, and learning other skills, worked with David Long um, as well uh, alongside Glenn Romanus and Brody Hill um, in Warrnambool to create these stoneworks. David was a, is a well-known um, stonemason and yeah, there's another one here. So, you know, working with our designs, he was able to help us see um, these works come to completion and working with him and learning from him too. Um, some some um, big sculptures are um, ephemeral or temporary. This was for a UCI bike race in Geelong, which they had helicopters flying around, so it could be viewed from above. It was made out of um, some pine trees that have been chopped down in the, the local garden. So we used that timber to make these she oak cones. So there's a story, the she oak cones make up a constellation of the Southern Cross. And, you know, the other patterns there are just with um, gravels, in which were all scooped up and taken away. But before that happened, if you go to the next one, um, we set fire to them. And from a helicopter from the air, they glowed in the, the constellation of the Southern Cross. Um, do you want me to keep just going? I, I reckon just, just um, and then we'll wind up. Um, I yeah, probably just... wouldn't, yeah, coming towards working um, perhaps not just from home studio base mm. in the next door neighbour's garden. Yes. Um, <laughs> to, to, where, to, where, to where you work now, would you be? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because, well? yeah. you know, obviously I've gone from the graphic design and, you know, gone into, you hear some images of me in my home studio illustrating. Um, but I also, uh, the three-dimensional work, yeah, I was working on a residential vacant block in Janjuk for probably a short time with a chainsaw. Um, and then the opportunity to um, take up residence at Ashmore Arts came about. And I've got to thank Stuart Guthrie for giving me that opportunity. And uh, I was the first to, to join and, and take up residence at Ashmore Arts, Glen Romanus soon to follow, and then now over quite a few years, I think I think 15 years or something, we have um, we have over 20 businesses that are running out of that place. So again, this it's it's such an inspiring place because I feel like yeah, well, there's a creative tribe again, and we have people that can. Um, Skillshare and see what others are doing, and it just—it's very, very inspiring. And yeah, I think Ashmore Arts is something to treasure. And so, some of the images that are leading up are some of your more recent um, projects that you've been illustrating. Yeah, I thought uh, if we go back a couple of photos, um, there was a couple of photos of me illustrating. You know, I was working on a 
on a wildlife art project for land, land care. So 135 paintings over about eight years mm. in these wildlife collector cards. Um, and that has moved on. Well, it's funny, some people think, some people know me as an illustrator or painter and other people only know me as a sculptor. And then some other people only know me as a musician. musician so this, this is the graphic works that I produce for um, the band that, I, that I'm involved with, Muna. And also the next one, was, which is an incarnation into a bigger band called Lucy in the Night Sky with Lucy O'Grady at the helm. Um, and then if we go to the next shot, I just wanted to wind up with something that I'm working on right now. So I've been approached by author Ali Cork uh, in the Otways to produce, uh, to illustrate her, her children's book. So this is a quick sketch for that. And the next shot is a finished illustration. And then the next shot is something that's sitting in my workshop right now, which is a carved door for a private job. So that's a, a, a brief snapshot of, of what I'm up to. And that's basically it in a nutshell from us. So, <laughs> <laughs> and, and here we are. Yeah. Thank you both so much. I mean, I, in some ways I was feeling very greedy as you were having that discussion because obviously for me is you know, Julie's pre what's the what's the other side to predecessor? Is the person who, you know, is now the arts development officer. I've just had this incredible insight. But it's so fascinating to hear, you know, how I mean, I totally agree with you, you know, everything, those small ideas and you just go, oh yeah, we'll do this. I mean, that's like, you know, how fundamental it was for you, Julie, becoming an, an arts development officer before really arts development officers were a thing. And so you just, I think any creative process, you grab it and you hold it and go, yep, and we'll work it out later, which is pretty similar to what we're doing with Portal right now. So everyone, I did want to, um, if you're watching over Facebook or YouTube and you'd like to join the discussion with us, um, you can either keep in touch with our socials or, jo or join, join the Zoom. If you want to ask questions now, however, um, I'm just going to pull up my little chat function and see what's going on here. So I'm going to ask the question, and now everyone, I'm working on a laptop, so they're going to come in really quickly, and I might be, you know, have a little bit of difficulty reading through them. But um, you've got lots of um, fabulous people loving you. Um, Councillor Margot Smith is with us, and she's saying she loves Shark Park. Um, apparently, we all look good too. Uh, which, which, which was named by the community. It wasn't Shark Park. Shark Park. No, no, it, it really had a name, Moona Park, but it's colloquialisms win. <laughs> <laughs> they do. What is loved? Um, I really loved how you talked about how green you were when you did that Barwon, uh, the Barwon heads work because of the, you know, the detail in that work. And actually for me, I think that was one of the first pieces of artwork I saw when I moved down here. And I was wandering around going, so what goes on in this place? And then I stumbled across that and I was going, oh. And it was actually the first place that I began to have a little bit of understanding about who the traditional owners were and stuff. And so while we're waiting for people to, you know, flick some questions through or something, I did want to talk about that because not only were, you know, like I think we, we talked yesterday a bit briefly, Julie, about um you know, it was really early for local government to start having arts development offices. And I think we have to put that in the context of the federal government at the time and how strong, you know, how strongly supported the arts were, how understood they were by people like Paul Keating and stuff. But also, it's really early in Victoria in, in the mid 90s to start seeing representation of Indigenous themes, isn't it? It is. And we were lucky um, to have permissions to actually have the storytelling so as well as um, the sundial um, and the work that Mark and Glenn did um, at Bowen Heads we've also got um, the mural um, which Mark um, which Glenn did um, on the community house at Anglesey and that sort of shows the river mouth and is sort of telling that story there. The Bell's mural um, which is that collaboration with uh, Mark Glenn, a little bit of Tom Giddings, a little bit of a couple of other people yeah, as well, yeah. Um, yeah. tells a couple of stories of the Wanji spirit and the Mindy spirit, um, which are which are quite extraordinary. I, I did actually have quite a few, a number of other um, 
toilet blocks down the coast. I actually had an article <laughs> in the age about the incontinence tour you could probably take. <laughs> but we slowed down because toilet blocks, while it seems strange, were we, there weren't many walls. We don't have the silos. I mean, we, if we'd had the silos, we would have been doing a silo trail years ago. But the walls that we had were the public facilities. So we actually were using those as much as possible to put the art out, out there and encourage and take broader community on a journey with us in that sense as well, which was, um, you know, strange in some ways but also effective in others so yeah. and, and really groundbreaking I think yeah, you yeah. know like I think it's really important for us to remember that we've really only started recognizing the stories that come from the Indigenous history mm -hmm. of our country you know in the last sort of 10 years and things you know so to be out there in large-scale public murals and things um, I'm a bit disappointed to hear that that was the what did you say um I haven't done a dunny, I haven't done a dunny since. I just love that phrase. But I think we're going to have to, you know. I think there's more projects looming out there that we could work on. And yeah. in fact, I, I, um, there was an artist whose work was in the um, calendar, the community calendar for this year, Elizabeth Gill, and she's got a bit. She's um, she's got a holiday house in Anglesey. She spends a lot of time there. Has had it for decades. You probably know her, Julie. Um, but she's got a bit of a fascination with the dunny block. The sort of you know. Surf Coast Shire, Dunny Block. So, you know, we could get some collaborative thing going on or something. Um, yeah, the other said, interesting thing from that um, Bell's Dunny mural was that, that mm. it, it was sort of the start of something and then what came, some projects that came after that was was connection with the Spirit of Surfing movement mm. and connecting mm. with the, the, the Shire's pro program and um, surfing institutions about respect and were about respecting the water and we had those great stone tablets that were installed with right with text on them mm. on the, the the stairs um, up and down from that car park and the toilet block down to the mm. surf roads. so it was really embraced and even you know I was doing some touches touch-ups a couple of years ago and you know 20 oh what that, yeah I guess 15 plus years on 15 no 25 25 years on. 25 years on. both looking bloody good i'll say yeah haven't aged a bit um, <laughs> and yeah people were turning it tourists were turning up that had never seen it before and were taking mm. photos and just like wow this is fantastic yeah and 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 i'm not sure whether it's a good thing or a bad thing but it actually has been heritage listed so even to get Mark to do work on it, we actually have to go through a whole process now, which is a bit awkward, <laughs> a bit um, say la vie. So it's been recognised um, as a significant work. Yeah. Um, and sometimes care. works, works have, right. have, have mm. their time. Yeah, know, that's right. Yeah. And, and, and they help um, to begin those always, conversations. As long as, mm. as long as that message is in the community and the community carry it on in, what, in whatever way they can, mm. You know, at, at least that message is being heard, whether that absolutely or block falls down or gets demolished or condemned or whatever, you know, which is highly likely. But um, I wanted to um, touch back. So people are probably, there. I think they're enjoying listening to you too much. So I will ask another question. Everyone out there, you can shut me up whenever you want. Just flick us the question. But yeah. I wanted to touch back to, um, you were talking about Gilbert Street back in, back in 1995. Yep. and how there was so much public artwork around at the time. And that's something, you know, I'm really interested in that. And because I think, you know, revitalisation of some of our precincts is really crucial going forward. And I think this conversation is going to be important to help us bring people who perhaps aren't so open to or a bit afraid of public art. I'm really hoping that these conversations are going to help us, you know, yeah. get so the value out there again. So the very early one, I wouldn't even call it public art. It was really private art because they were within the actual shops sure. themselves. Yeah. Um, more recently, though, um, I had an artist whose name is Katie. Well, I can't think of a surname. but And she did the mosaics on the seats um, in, in the street. So they're a more subtle piece, but mm. they were just literally a, um, a red brick bench 
but we actually were able to judge them and add more stories because there are sea images, etc., along the way. Um, Bell Street as well, there's a couple of little sculptures when we redid Bell Street. Um, there's the um, um, sword, the, the, oh, the, the stingray. stingray. There's a yeah. stingray in Bell Street. So we always have tried to have that um, artist involvement and working with the community about what story to tell for that particular location and how to, again, turn it into a place and have that really important placemaking um, element there. Um, so, yeah, so it's been interesting along the way and every now and again things need to change because communities change slightly or different stories need to be told so yeah, yeah. Um, it, it is important to keep re-looking at what's there mm -hmm. and, and what we can do with um, the places similarly with playgrounds they may change again but so important to actually have those art elements one of the most magical playgrounds that I think of, um, I don't know if you've actually got any work in it, um, is the White Speech Playground. So Kirsty Manger right. and Claire and Kyla Glenn. and Glenn have all got work in there and, there and that has a very strong Indigenous storytelling element to it and mm. it does turn it into a magical place because it's not just a slide or a swing. There are adventures and little elements to find in the pavement and all of these water droplets and all of these things which have been um, beautifully created or done um, as a community arts project. Like Mark mm. said, sometimes you have an artist who's a good artist who makes public art and then you have an artist who can cope with working with community <laughs> but lead them to create beautiful art and actually manage um, that side of the thing. So you've had, um, yeah, so I think we, we yeah. often overlook those opportunities and spaces um, to incorporate um, and take the time. Sometimes mm. it's not a quick fix. It's sometimes it might be 18 months to two years. When we were redoing um, Anglesey in the early days, it was an 18-month taking people on that journey and talking people through it. And that allows then the artists who become involved to actually learn and engage with the community more and learn more about um, the things. And it's not, you know, quick fix and quick, you know, because it then takes a while to create and install the beautiful artworks as well. Yeah, yeah. and get the ideas to percolate yeah. all come together. Right. Yeah. So we've got, um, so the, your mural artist was Kate Van Newton? Yes, Kate Van Newton, yes, yep. that's right. Um, one question, Sally, uh, Sally, it may be Sally Groom, um, was interested in the mural on the Coles building. Was that commissioned by Coles or how did that come about? Well, yeah, it was commissioned by Coles and it was under, under the directive of the Serco Shire. Yeah. Uh, it was a it was a big ugly wall, and to keep obviously to you know big ugly wall in a residential street. Mm -hmm. uh, so yes, Surf Coast Shire directed Coles to Glenn and myself, um, and we produced that work. We had already produced um, a playground for Coles in Lara, and we did Coles also funded the. The playground at the front of Whole Foods in mm. that Torquay complex uh, as well. Yeah, so, yeah, that was came that was directly funded by by Coles. Kyla has also asked if the sundial has been heritage listed. You know, I don't. I haven't heard. I don't believe so. Um, mm. It's it's a potential for it to be done, but um, you have to actually think about it, Kyla, because um, when you when you and Claire pop down and do the mo touch up mosaicing if it becomes heritage listing you wouldn't be able to just go and fix it you would actually have to do the process is actually applying to the heritage people Lord. and then they decide who the right person is to do the work not necessarily <laughs> the artist I mean oh my god so it's it's a double-edged sword heritage listing so you know yeah, sometimes um, you have to be careful for what you wish for. So um, yeah, it's an mm. interesting thing. But I yeah. haven't heard. I don't. I don't know. I haven't actually heard. Um, it, I don't think so. 
that I've been And, yeah. and that, that, that's, that issue of who's going to fix it is mm. applies to most public art, and that's mm. part of, you know, writing that into a, an artist's contract with the owner. Yeah. Mm. Or whatever, that if there is, there's got to be a maintenance schedule. Mm. <clears throat> this is all the business side of things of creating art, which yeah. side of thing is just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, but yeah, we 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 say that to, in the works that I'm involved with that we have first preference of doing maintenance um, for a fee, of course, mm, yeah. because it is you know we are working as professional artists and this is our income, this is our living. So um, yeah, and I, I I like to take this opportunity to acknowledge all the artists that around this shire that have produced work. Obviously, this talk is very much about us, um, but yeah, there's there's so many people that have creating great work and you know in in various various different fields and I, yeah I can't wait to see some more facilities pop up um, mm. to house the arts in, in this area too yeah I think that's an, another really interesting point that you both made it, one it's I love the de, um, de, it delights me the creativity which with which arts communities do deal with issues like that the fact you know those fabulous shots of thousands of people on the beach and you're having outdoor performances and stuff. And then it's like, you know, we're looking back 25 years now, you know, and so the, the lack of facilities and stuff, you know, in many ways, we, we're in a similar place I and mean, we've got exciting, you know, things going ahead with the Sport and Rec Centre being handed over to the arts next year. But, you know, it's still, it's a long, slow process at local government, state government and federal government level, um, you know, funding for the arts. It's just got a lot more difficult but I think that the, the nut of it and what we're all talking about here is collaboration and community, you know, and being united. We might have different art forms or whatever. Yes, yeah. And, and that's what we've only really touched a moment on music, a lot on visual arts. But, of course, there are so many other art forms out there and um, the local theatre groups and theatre troops um, have been producing extraordinary um productions over the years um, from Anglesey and um, Torquay Theatre Troupe and Winch um, Rep Society. They're all there. And there are a couple of private small groups. So, so Dave Kelman and Jane Rafe um, live locally and they're a professional theatre company, you know, who work often in Melbourne but have actually worked for us around here as well. So we, we have, we often have, a hidden element, you know, that's rumbling along and making sure that things are happening for us as mm -hmm. well. Again, yeah, as I said, for a, a space where a theatre troupe can actually go into and go, yay, <laughs> it will be very exciting. Yeah, and, and, and a lot of great musicians mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. have come out of this area yeah. And, yeah. and have moved and yeah. have, have left, you know, and we, we don't really have the facilities to do that. And, you know, in the creative arts, um, in music, you know, we a lot of those musicians and bands don't fit into the pub scene mm. um, creating original music and you know we had a great opportunity and I, we, I keep, we keep going back to this early 90s periods where it was just this flourishing and we had the Laura Connors Mermaid Cafe oh. down at um, Zilli Bay in, the, in the, the milk bar at the caravan park which is now the, the Wyndham or whatever it is. The big, oh, the big yeah. hotel there. Yep. Anyway, so, you know, there was, we had live music there. Well, um, Beach mm. Next got going again. So that was um, Jeff Regulus, who we also know yeah. as a visual artist and his some of his sculptures down in Aries. I mean, mm. he got um, Beach Next up and going. There. And, and Tiffany yeah, Eckhart yeah. was there. Yeah. And, you know, there was, yeah, was, there was Muna and there was also oh, young yeah. Xavier Rudd would yeah. come along yeah. and, you know, things like that. It was, it was a really vibrant. Tom, mm. yeah, the, mm. how do we keep those people mm. here? Mm. Um, everyone, we are running. We have run out of time. I'm gonna. I just want to thank you both so much. It really has been delightful. I'm so touched, and I wish I could give you both a kiss, but I can't because it's illegal. Um, We've been so lucky here on the Surf Coast, I think, it, that in the main COVID has touched wood, allow most of us to take stock, to reflect and to begin to ask those questions that we usually don't have time for. So this has been a fabulous reminder of the things that have underpinned our art scene for decades. And if we're truthful, way beyond that, because creativity and community were absolutely the key in underpinning notions for all First Nations people. 
<clears throat> this glorious landscape and coast and the people that make up our community. I want to thank you both again for your generosity and trust that you're willing to, and trust in us that you're willing to lead this first conversation. Um, for those of you at home, don't forget to tune in this coming Thursday at 10 a.m. to hear another wonderful Surf Coast artist, children's author and illustrator Renee Tremel, who will be reading from her latest works live from Talkie Books. And on Friday, speaking about young up and coming musos and stuff, we're gonna give you a glimpse into the world of our younger artists and performers, four of the Surf Coast fabulous new songwriters as part of Friday Night in the Freezer. And then next Sunday, uh, with our next Sunday morning session, we're gonna explore what it means at the personal level to work towards, to walk towards treaty in the session, Treaty on Wadarung Country. So if you would join me in conversation with Wadarung Women, too many W's. What are on woman Karina Eccles and her collaborator and photographic artist Fern Millen as they discuss what it means to walk towards treaty on this land. Thank you so much again. Thanks everyone for being here. Thank you. Have a lovely day and um, thank you to you too, really. Um, and thanks for all the lovely comments, everybody. Yes, thanks yeah. for listening. Yeah. Yes. We've got some lovely comments. And, yeah, anyone, if you want to get some feedback, give us some feedback about this session or anything, please just shoot us an email. Uh, but after that, we'll say thanks again and um, see you later in the week. Uh, Adios. Bye.